Why do so many people say that their loved ones are watching down on them from heaven? Is that really true? What are my thoughts on postpartum depression? What's my favorite podcast? How do we reconcile relationships with people who have hurt us? Answering all of these questions and more on today's episode of Relatable, which is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Hope everyone is having a wonderful day and week so far. Okay, we've got a Q&A episode today answering all of your fascinating questions. The first question that I wanna answer is, why do so many Christians say their loved ones are watching them from heaven? This is a very popular idea, not just within Christianity, but I would say kind of culture at large, believing that after your loved ones die, that they're watching you, that they're with you, that they're looking down on you. And there's a sense of comfort that comes from that. I mean, there have been many testimonies of people who say that after a loved one died, that they have dreams about their loved one speaking to them, that it almost feels like some kind of visitation or that your loved one who died maybe becomes your guardian angel. They're watching out for you. They're making sure that things work out in your life or they're kind of like a spirit or a force for good in betterment. And while all of these things may feel comforting, there's not actually any biblical precedence for them. So I'll look at a few passages that some people use to try to say that the Bible does indicate that dead people can see us from the afterlife, can see us from heaven, and therefore we can say that they look down on us. Or they might even use these passages for the justification of the Catholic belief that saints um, who are in heaven or even Mary who is in heaven can uh, deliver our prayers, can hear our prayers and deliver them to God, which is not what Protestants believe because we don't see any biblical support for that. But sticking with this particular question, um, can our loved ones look down and see us if they are in heaven? Some use Hebrews 12, 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off the sin that entangles, run the race marked out for us. I'm paraphrasing that last part, but the important part, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And people use that verse to say, well, they're witnesses. We are surrounded by them. They are witnessing our life. Or some people um, might use the parable in Luke 16, 28, the rich man in Lazarus looking from Hades at the poor man who is being comforted in Abraham's bosom and is asking, please, can you warn my brothers who are still on earth? Can you uh, testify to them about what I did not know so they don't end up where I am? Or people might use Revelation 6.10, um, where the martyrs call for God to avenge their deaths. And so people use a variety of passages to try to say that people who are dead can see us here on earth, but none of these passages are actually speaking to that. If you look at Hebrews 12, 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, just like with all passages, we have to look at it in context. So it's building off of Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 11 is looking at the uh the is is looking at the kind of heroes of the faith. And so the witnesses that we are talking about in Hebrews 12, they are witnesses to the life that is lived by faith. They are witnesses to the reward of our faith. They're not necessarily or they're not witnesses of our lives. There's nothing in this passage that indicates that these people are looking down from heaven, that they are answering our prayers or that their presence is with us in any way. It's actually very clear that they are in heaven. And so these are people who have witnessed what the power of the Holy Spirit can do in a life that is surrendered to God. And we look to their testimonies for encouragement, um, but they are not according to scripture, with us, hearing our prayers, etc. And then if you look at this parable of the rich man in Lazarus who is asking, hey, 
Can you please testify to my brothers so they don't end up in this horrible place? Hades, again, we don't see any, any indication that he is hearing the prayers or um, seeing his brothers on earth. He just has knowledge of it. And there's only so much that we can really draw from a parable. And um, then you've got Revelation, the martyrs calling for God to avenge their deaths Again, there's no indication here that martyrs are actually the ones who are dead or seeing anything that is going on um, here on earth. And so we just don't see biblical support for that idea or the idea that people become angels when they die. I understand that there are things that we say to try to comfort ourselves in death or try to comfort other people in death. And I don't think right after death is the time to correct someone's theology in that way. I do think it's important to talk about in general. I don't think we should just say, well, whatever makes someone feel good, because look, theology has practical consequences. And so it's important to correct our theology on this, although I do think that there is a time and a place. The reality is, and this is where the real comfort comes from, usually like false teachings, teachings that are not supported by scripture, they indicate our need for something that can really only be found in Christ, some something that can only be found in truth. And so if what you are seeking, if what you are needing is comfort, is presence, is guidance, and is protection, and you like the idea of that coming from a higher, like ethereal being that can see more things than you can, then look to Christ. Look to God. I mean, there is a reason, many reasons, why God refers to himself as our Father if we have been saved by Christ. We are his children. We are co-heirs with Christ. We belong to him. We are a part of his family. We are a part of his kingdom. And he does see everything. He does know everything. Psalm 139 says that he purposed, planned every single day of our life before any of them came to be. He knit us together in our mother's womb. We see in scripture that he knows everything, that he sees everything, that he is not limited by time or space, that he actually is suspended in the eternal now, meaning that he is not limited by the present moment. He's not on this linear timeline that you and I are, something that we can't even fully comprehend because right now we are you know, limited by those constraints that God is not limited by. So it's hard for us to even understand the eternality of his character. But wow, if we're looking for power, like if we're looking for providence, if we are looking to be comforted by something that is bigger, that is greater than us, that is mysterious, and yet loves us and knows us and cares about what's best for us, then let's look to God himself, whom we can have an intimate relationship with through Christ, who brings to us through his death and resurrection by grace, through faith, reconciliation with the holy God, restoration to a holy God and relationship with a holy God. And it is uncomfortable to think about, wow, our loved one who we loved so much here on earth, who we knew so well that they are in heaven and they're preoccupied with something else. But they are. They are. If they are in heaven, they are totally and completely and joyfully consumed by the worship of the glory of Christ. And that's exactly what we want for them. We don't want them to be worried with the anxieties of this life. That's what they have graciously escaped. And if they are in the presence of Christ, they've got a lot going on. They've got a lot going on that doesn't have to do with us. Now, we will recognize our loved ones in heaven. So there is, there may be, you know, joyous reunions there. But if you want to take comfort in one, your own providence and someone who's watching out for you, take comfort, Christian, in that there is a God who sees you and knows you and loves you very much. And Romans 8, 28 says that he is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean happiness. That doesn't mean always ease. That doesn't mean always comfort. It actually could mean tragedy. It could mean tribulation. It could mean trials. But in the end, all things work together for the good of those who love, the, uh, love him and for the glory of God. So that's one piece of comfort there. The other piece of comfort that we should have rather than thinking that our loved ones are somehow intertwined in our lives is that they are consumed by the glory and the peace of God finally and fully and are fully whole and fully healed. And they don't have to mess with the temporal worries that we have here on earth. So 
typically like the longings that are superficially fulfilled by false doctrines, um, they speak to something that we actually need, but are always much more profoundly answered and satisfied by the truth and what the gospel actually brings us. Um, and so just keep that in mind. And again, a time and a place for that kind of kind of correction, but it absolutely does matter. Let us not put our hope and our comfort in lesser and lesser things when Christ is the one who fully satisfies. Okay, did you guys know that you can actually help save lives and serve a greater purpose just by buying coffee? Now, not if you buy coffee from companies that hate you and hate your values and support things like abortion and gender confusion and all of that. But if you buy your coffee from a place like Seven Weeks Coffee, you can actually protect lives inside the womb. The reason Seven Weeks Coffee has its name is because at seven weeks gestation, that baby inside the womb is the size of a coffee bean. They're pro-life, which is why they donate 10% of every sale to pregnancy resource centers. These centers are providing all kinds of resources to moms in need to help them choose life. And so now seven weeks supports over 500 of these pregnancy centers and their coffee is really, really good, really high quality, organically farmed. They work with the farmers, make sure these farmers are totally taken care of because they're not just pro-life, they're pro-abundant life too. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use code Allie at checkout for 10% off your order. Sevenweekscoffee.com code Allie. Thoughts on, this is different, you know, lots of variety here. Thoughts on postpartum depression. So postpartum depression is a thing. I think that we have neglected, probably ignored and minimized for a while, but that is talked about a lot more. Now, I do want to, I do want to differentiate and I'm not speaking as a psychologist or psychiatrist myself. I'm just speaking as a mom. I'm also speaking as someone who interviews and talks to a lot of very learned experts um, in this field because unfortunately, psychology, psychiatry, it's all become political. And so there are conversations to be had about the pharmaceutical companies and about the marketing and about the medical industry and how all of these things play into the different diagnoses that we are told that we have and all of that. So as I say my opinion, I'm speaking as someone who is just an amateur myself, just a, you know, a normal plebe, but who cares about that stuff and who has had children. So I've experienced this. So um, I do think postpartum depression is an important thing to name, an important thing to talk about. At the same time, I don't want to medicalize something that is normal. It is normal for you to feel very emotional, even teary, and stressed and tired in the postpartum period. That Now, just wait. I'm not minimizing real actual depression. Just wait. But I am telling you, just because you feel those things, just because it's difficult, just because you might even feel like sometimes you're losing your mind, does not mean that you have a medical diagnosis, does not necessarily mean that you need to go on any kind of medication. Maybe you need to see a counselor, just in general, I think some as long as it's a biblical counselor, that can be a good idea. Maybe you need to talk to a friend. Maybe you need to ask for more help. That's a big thing. That's probably the biggest thing that I see, that moms, after they give birth, they won't ask for more help. They want to do everything themselves. Stop it. Stop. Stop vacuuming. Stop folding your laundry. It's fine. Don't do it. Let other people do it or don't do it at all. Don't try to keep it all together. Don't try to lose weight right away. Don't worry. Don't do the things that don't have to be done. Um, so maybe all those things are true, but also don't make yourself even more anxious with trying to diagnose yourself with something when maybe it's not really a diagnosis. It is very, very normal, very common, and I think very okay for you to go through a period of emotional adjustment, not just because, wow, you've had so much physical change over the past few months and over just the past few days if you just gave birth. Oh my gosh, your hormones are everywhere. And not just that, but there's a lot of emotions that don't even have to do with hormones 
that come with giving birth. Oh my goodness, that's such a significant period in your life. There's probably a lot of pain, maybe a lot of hardship, a lot of stress, a lot of adrenaline, a lot of maybe fear, and then a whole lot of happiness and a whole lot of love and a whole lot of connection. Like no matter what you're going through, if you have a combination of all of those things within like a 24 hour period, that is going to be very significant. That's going to do something to your system. So if you feel a little bit jarred after that, add on top of that, all of the hormones that change, like when your baby, and sorry, a little graphic for the guys, but your placenta leaves your body, and then you immediately start producing milk and breastfeeding, there is so much hormonal change that has to come from that. And again, that's normal. And then you're recovering possibly from an epidural. Maybe you're recovering from a C-section. You've got medication, pain medication that maybe you're dealing with. You're still dealing with the pain after effects of that, whether it was a natural birth or whether it was a C-section, whatever it was. And then you're dealing with a lack of sleep. You might be dealing with the pain of breastfeeding or the stress of breastfeeding. And then you're also, maybe you have other kids and they don't understand. They need you just as much. They want to, you know, they want to be cuddled. They want to be held. They want to be fed. And then depending on your financial situation, there are so many factors. There's so much that goes on. So if you feel a little sad or really sad, like if you feel stressed, if you feel tired because you're not sleeping, all of those things are normal. I'm not saying that they're okay and that they feel good or that you should just ignore them. You should be taking stock of your emotions. However, okay, so here's where I get to something else. There is a difference, I believe, in my amateur opinion, between that and the very normal ups and downs, emotional ups and downs, physical ups and downs of postpartum, which by the way, don't just last for three days. They don't just last for three months. I think postpartum is like a year plus by the way. I really do. I think that that whole like hormonal, mental, emotional, even spiritual, physical adjustment period lasts for a year plus, depending on how your birth went and stuff. Um, but there is a difference between that, which I think is normal and should be dealt with in a variety of ways that maybe don't have to do with medication at all, or even professional help at all. And then the depression, the psychosis, the anxiety that gets to the point where it is debilitating. You literally cannot stop crying. You don't even feel like you can leave the house because you are so anxious about something happening to your child. You start having psychotic episodes or psychotic thoughts about harming yourself or harming other people. You feel this, unfortunately, this has happened to women. I personally haven't experienced these things, but this has happened to women, women who are good moms, women who are Christians, women who are very stable people. Something happens in postpartum and they are mean to their, they're, they're mean to their families. They feel an aversion towards the people who love them. They become very angry. They start acting out and saying things that are totally not in line with their character. So postpartum depression, anxiety, psychosis are real things where these things become so overwhelming, so persistent, consistent, debilitating, and seemingly unfixable. Even when the external factors are all kind of like put into place and all of that, that may need professional help. And it's really important to know that there should not be embarrassment when it comes to seeking professional help for those things. There should not be shame when it comes to naming what you actually have. And you know, sometimes hindsight is twenty twenty, and you don't realize that you're in one of those, that you have one of those diagnoses or you have something like that. Um, and now I'm not someone who is going to say, this just depends on case by case. And I'm really glad that I don't have the authority and don't claim the authority to this. I'm not even saying that like, medication is always necessary in those cases. I don't know. That depends. There are a lot of different opinions on that. And obviously you have to go to your provider and see about that. But I'm just saying those things do need to be addressed. They need more help. They need serious attention. And you need more than anything in that moment when you realize this has gone too far. I can't even be a mom. I can't even, I don't want to get up. I can't even live my life right now. I can't even function at all like a normal human. This is more than just baby blues. You need, first of all, someone else beside you to take that seriously, very seriously, and to say, don't worry, we love you. You are a great mom, and we are going to get you the help that you need. Um, looking back at my last two births, as I'm recording this, I don't know when it's going to come out. I'm pregnant, so I 
haven't had my third baby yet. But looking back at my first two births, I realized that my first one, I don't, I don't know. I still don't know if I had official postpartum depression and anxiety, but comparing now, now that I can compare after my first birth and after my second, I realize that how I felt after my first birth, I was really, really low. And I think I just thought that it was baby blues. And now looking back at how much I was crying, how debilitating my anxiety was, how constantly scared I was that something was going to happen to my baby, that I was one of those people that did not want to drive in the car. I was one of those people that did not want to leave my house. I was one of those people that was so scared that someone was going to touch her and get her sick. I was so like germophobic, which, okay, that's okay. I guess to some degree you do want to protect your child from those things. But it was to the point to where I like could not enjoy anything. I couldn't enjoy other people interacting with my child. I couldn't enjoy leaving my child and resting and doing what I needed to do. Like I was so scared to go to church. I was so scared to do anything. And I was so sad, not about motherhood. I I did with both my children. I had that instant connection of just overwhelming love. And I know some people like struggle with that depending on how the birth went. It just kind of depends. I, I never suffered from that. I had the immediate love, the immediate connection, the immediate feeling of just like protection and overwhelming care for this little person. But with my first, I was so, so anxious and just so down. And I think I had, well, I had like a traumatic birth that didn't go how I wanted it to. So that certainly played into it. And then with my second, like I felt good physically. Maybe that was part of it. Physically, I felt really good after my second one, like the day off. Um, and that wasn't true with my first. I dealt with like a lot of pain in my recovery with my first. With my second, I really didn't. But I also emotionally, like I felt fine. Like and my husband noted, like right after I I had the second, like, wow, like you are different. This is like just your posture. You are so much more you're so much more okay than after our first, even like how I was walking, how I was talking, how I was dealing with things. And I didn't go through that constant, like, oh my gosh, I can't leave the house. Oh my gosh. I don't know what to do. Oh my gosh. I'm so sad. And uh, everything reminds me of like my birth. And I'm so sad. Like I didn't have that after my second. And it wasn't until I had that postpartum experience that I looked back at my first and said, oh, that was a lot more difficult. Maybe that wasn't normal. Maybe it was PPD or PPD slash A. I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm still not sure, but there are variations. So I'll just, I'll just say that, but I also didn't realize, and this is something that y'all can look into. I don't have the study in front of me, but Pitocin, that's the, uh, synthetic form of oxytocin, which is what your body is creating in lots of different situations, but requires for birth and your body naturally creates it. Um, but Pitocin is something that they can give you intravenously to cause contractions, whether you are after birth, whether you're trying to eject the placenta or um, after birth, if they're trying to get you to stop bleeding or during birth, like if you're getting induced and you need help contracting to get the baby out. Um, Pitocin can actually increase your chances of postpartum depression. I don't know exactly scientifically why that is. I'm guessing it's just inserting a synthetic hormone into your body. It can have a particular reaction, a particular response. With my first child, I had Pitocin. Not very much of it, but I had it for a few hours. With my second, I didn't at all. So I don't know if for me that was was a contributor or if it was just my second child and that's just, you know, how I it was just easier because you're like, oh, I have a track record now of keeping a human alive. Great. I think I can do it a second time Um, or what it was. So anyway, that's my long-winded answer about postpartum depression and my personal experiences. We'll see what it's like with my, with my third. I'll let y'all know when we're back in action. Um, But yeah, I, I would just, I would just encourage you one to not dwell on it too much. If you just have like normal baby blues, but two, to take stock of your emotions and to take stock of your thoughts and to take stock of like how you're really doing and have someone in your life, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your mom, whether it's your sister or close friend that is helping you keep stock. And look, if you're about to give birth, maybe go ahead and tell that person now, whoever your person is, um, Hey, 
like, I'm going to need you to be kind of like, I, I need you to like, watch out for me. I need you to observe. I need you to like, make sure that I'm doing okay, because you might not always be the best indicator of that because sometimes we're too close to things to see them how they are. So you need someone to be able to zoom out who really knows you, who's like, yeah, I don't think you're okay. Or yeah, I think that you're fine. Um, Especially if someone knew you in your last births and things like that. So that's what I would encourage. All right, I've got a new code for your Carly Jean Los Angeles order. So you have to listen up. If you don't know what Carly Jean Los Angeles is, then you must be new to this podcast because I'm talking about them all the time because it's basically the only thing that I wear. I absolutely love Carly Jean Los Angeles. It's a family-owned company. Carly and her family, they're strong Christians. They have the same values that you and I do, and they just sell the cutest, most comfortable, most versatile clothes ever. Their entire basics line is also all made in the U.S. You know how important that is to me, but all of their clothes, super high quality, really great in every season of the year, but also every season of life. I'm postpartum now. I can wear a lot of the stuff that I was wearing both pre-pregnancy and during pregnancy because that's just the kind of uh, versatility that Carly Jean Los Angeles offers. My favorite thing that they sell is their jeans, so I would highly recommend checking that out. Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use promo code RELATABLE for 20% off, excluding final sale items. This code is one-time use only. So CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com, code RELATABLE. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com, code RELATABLE. All right. Next question. Um, okay, so we talked about birth. Let's talk about death for a second. Cremation versus burial. I don't really have a strong opinion on this. Uh, the Catholic Church for a while was, I'm not Catholic, but I know that they were for a while totally against cremation because of the doctrine or because of the um, biblical passage about the resurrection of the bodies. But I'm not, I don't think that that is a good reason. Maybe that's not the only reason for, um, that's not the only reason that the Catholic church had. So I'm not saying that, but I still see people Protestant or Catholic kind of saying that today about the resurrection of the bodies and that we shouldn't be cremated because of that, or it's just like a destruction of the body. And so it's disrespectful to image bearers and to the design that the body has made. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know anyone in my family who has been cremated, I don't know anyone in my family who wants to be cremated. I don't necessarily think that that's the best option, but I'm not saying that there's biblical foundation for that or that I'm like authoritative on that. That's just kind of an opinion that I have that I, d I don't know. I don't think I would want to destroy the body, but I I'm not worried at all about the resurrection of the bodies. Look, there are people who, I mean, there are martyrs who were burned to life. So they were basically cremated. And there are people who die in all kinds of terrible accidents where their bodies are basically destroyed. I think the power of God, if he can raise people from the dead, like he can make beauty and human form from ashes, right? We know that the power of God can do that. So I'm not worried for that reason. Personally, though, and I'm sure there are some other reasons that people had, I would not, I would not do cremation. Um, what's your favorite podcast? So I'm going to tell, I'm going to let you in on a secret that we podcasters have is that we don't really listen to other podcasts very often. Um, I, now I love, there are other podcasts that I love. I do not listen to any podcast daily. It takes a freaking long time to get ready for this podcast and then to record this podcast. And sometimes we're recording multiple podcasts in a day because I got to go out of town. I got something to do, or I got maternity leave. And so that's multiple hours of my day. I don't typically, and then after that, like I'm, I'm full on doing other things. I'm full on mom. And so I just don't have time. People who like listen to podcasts and like mother at the same time, more power to you. I cannot, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't multitask like that. I got to put my brain to like one thing at a time. Um, and so, yeah, that part just not possible for me. Um, 
So I will listen if there's like, I'll listen to Megan Pel- Kelly's podcast, which is amazing. Um, I will listen sometimes to Ben Shapiro's podcast. I'll listen sometimes to Al Mohler's podcast. I'll listen to R.C. Sproul's podcast. I'll listen to Elizabeth Elliott's podcast. Or if there's a specific podcast episode that someone sends me. I will listen to that. But typically it's, I don't listen to a podcast episode unless it's like, ooh, this is a subject that I really want to hear explained or that I need broken down or I want to hear this particular person's take on that. So, I mean, there's a wide variety of people that I would listen to for that. I mean, there are different podcasts at Blaze TV. There are other, the other podcasts at The Daily Wire, I've probably listened to like all of these podcasts at least a few times. It just depends. It depends on what that person's talking about. It depends on what I want to know. Sometimes I'll listen to Joe Rogan's podcast if it's a guest that I really want to hear from. Very rarely listen to the whole thing, just to be honest. Um, so yeah, that and I would say that is true of most podcasters. And we all support each other. Liz Wheeler and I were talking about this the other day. Love your stuff support you. High five. Great. I don't listen to you very much. (laughs) And it's not because we're not fans. It's just because we don't have time in the day. So yeah, it just depends on the topic. Honestly, as far as listening to podcasts goes, I'm probably like your average podcast listener because there are the avid podcast listeners, but that's not very many people. I saw a Pew Research thing the other day that was like only 20% of Americans even ever listen to podcasts. And a much smaller percentage of that listen to a podcast every day, like 5% of that 20%. Um, Yeah. So not very many people listen to podcasts. I, and it's amazing to me how many people listen to this podcast every single day. And you listen to other, some of you listen to other podcasts too, which is incredible. I also, if I'm going to listen to one, I turn it on 1.5 times or two times. I don't know what that says. I feel like that's probably a bad indication of how your brain works. Not a good indication. I don't think it's an indication that, wow, you're so smart and you can process things so fast. I think it means you have a short attention span. And now if I try, I can't do it with Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro is already talking it two times. So if I try to speed him up, I can't understand him at all. But like if I have to go back and listen to this podcast for some reason, I just want to like, you know, decide social media clips or see if there's anything in there that I want to, I don't know, point out, whatever. Um, I will listen to it on two times. I cannot listen to myself on one times. I think I sound inebriated. I have to listen to myself twice as fast. And the fact like when you guys post screenshots of listening to this and it's on one times, I'm like so embarrassed. I'm like, oh my gosh, they have to listen to my what sounds like drunk alley. Um, But it works for y'all. I know y'all think I talk fast anyway, which I don't think that I do. But it just depends. I guess it just depends. Okay, y'all, it is that time of year, the time of year where everything is pumpkin spiced. And yes, I'm just a simple girl just like you. And I love pumpkin spiced everything in the fall and I'm not afraid to admit it. And that includes my bacon. Yes, I like pumpkin spiced bacon, but only if it's from Good Ranchers. Why? Because I care about what's in my meat and where it comes from. And I can trust if all of my meat, including my pumpkin spice bacon, is from Good Ranchers, then it's from only American farms and ranches, and they're totally transparent about what's in their meat. Right now, we got a lot of mystery meat in the grocery store. We don't really know where it comes from. We don't really know what's in it. There could even be mRNA vaccines in it. You don't have to worry about that stuff with Good Ranchers. Plus, you're supporting a company owned by people who love America. They love God. They're on our team. So there's really just there's there's no cons when it comes to getting your meat from Good Ranchers. That's why we love it so much. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout for $30 off. That's GoodRanchers.com. Go to Allie. GoodRanchers.com. Go to Allie. All right. Let's do maybe one more question. Let's see, how to reconcile relationships with family members who have hurt you. So reconciliation, I think, can be beautifully redemptive, but it is not always necessary for forgiveness. Reconciliation isn't always possible. If that person is hostile, 
to you and your family and your safety, true safety. I'm not just talking about like your emotional state, although that's important, but I'm talking about like really they're hostile to you, then you do not have to be reconciled to them. Reconciliation is not always a necessary part of forgiveness. I think it can be, and God can do that. God can do that with any like family relationship that he wants to restore. He can. That's going to take heart change, um, but it's not always possible and it's not always necessary. The important thing is for you to release that person from your grip of resentment and bitterness. And it's not because that person deserves it. They don't. But you also did not deserve the forgiveness that God gave you through Christ. Whatever someone did to us, real or exaggerated, sometimes we exaggerate the offense that people have committed against us, but sometimes we're right on. They really have offended us and hurt us in some way. Whatever offense that someone has committed against us, it is nothing like the offense that we have committed against a holy God as sinners. And if he was gracious enough as the perfect being that he is to forgive us, to make a way for us to be restored, to be made new, to be made right before uh, him and to come into relationship with him. If he did that to us while we were yet sinners, while we were his enemies, while we were scoffers, while we hated him, then of course we have the power, the ability to forgive someone else whose infraction, whose offense was much smaller in the grand scheme of things than the offense um, that we committed against God by being sinners. Um, and so that reality allows us to realize, I almost said reminds, but allows us to realize kind of the position that we're in. We're not as... Um, we're not as holy or as self-righteous as we think that we are, that we cannot extend forgiveness to other people. And forgiveness does not mean that what they did was okay. It doesn't mean that we forget about it. It doesn't mean that we weren't impacted by that betrayal, that rejection, that downright wickedness or meanness, whatever it was that they did toward us. It just means that one like we understand where we are orienting ourselves rightly in light of who we are in Christ and the gospel of forgiveness that he's bestowed on us, but um, also like who we are in relation to other people and how quickly this life goes by. And it allows us to realize too that life is, it's much too short to be entrapped by bitterness and resentment, which are sins. We are not to be dictated by bitterness and resentment, and we are actually burdening our own hearts. We are actually imprisoning ourselves when we hold grudges. Oh, I'm preaching to the choir. I can think of several people right now, not family members, but who have hurt me in the past, who I still, I'm like, I don't like that person. That person is not a good person. And I say that, you know, colloquially, good person. Like, I still see that person acting a fool and just being a slimy human being, I have a grudge. I have grudges and I have resentment. I have bitterness against people because of the offense that they've committed to me. I have not allowed that part of the gospel to seep into my heart and to realize there is really no reason for me to continue to hold that against him when God holds nothing against me and Christ. And also like that bitterness is weighing me down. That resentment is weighing me down. It is making it difficult for me to live totally freely. It's difficult for me to be completely spiritually liberated because that hardness of heart is still there. That heaviness, that weight, that bitterness brings is still there. And that inhibits like a truly joyful and peaceful life in Christ. That's like a, I mean, that's a gospel issue in my heart and in the hearts of other people that hold that bitterness. Um, it is like, it's about trusting the Lord too. It's about trusting Psalm 37 that, you know, the wicked will pay one day. There will be no more. Um, and the righteous will live on forever because of God's mercy and grace. And hopefully the person that we are withholding our forgiveness from, hopefully they 
will be counted among the righteous because of Christ. We shouldn't want their ultimate demise. But God is going to sort it all out. God is going to exact revenge where he needs to exact revenge. God is going to take care of you. He is not going to allow what someone did to you to somehow thwart his plan for your life. That's just not how it works. That person is not that powerful. The power that they really have over you is the authority that they've claimed on your heart through the grudge or the resentment or the bitterness that you still carry for them. So anyway, reconciliation can be great. If you can talk to that person, if you can have a conversation where you really speak truth and love, where you don't compromise, you don't acquiesce, but you do show them that you care about them as a person and God can use that if he wants to use that and he can bring restoration there. But the most important thing is, is that we allow God to free us from the bitterness and resentment that we are carrying because of the offense that they did commit against us. Um, all right. That's all we've got time for today. Thanks so much for listening. We will be back here tomorrow. Being prepared for emergency situations is really important, especially when you have kids to think about. And we might think about preparedness when it comes to like emergency food supplies or when it comes to emergency water supplies or different kinds of safety tools, but you might not be thinking about medical emergencies. Like what would you do if you didn't have access to the prescriptions that you or your kids rely on on a daily basis? What if you didn't have access to antibiotics? And maybe this seems far off, but with the supply chain issues that we've seen and knowing that so many of our medications are actually manufactured overseas, it's really not that crazy to think that it could be difficult one day to get the the medicine that you need, either because of um, you've got some kind of medical emergency that involves an infection that requires antibiotics, or whether it's just the daily thyroid medication that you take or the asthma medication that your kids take. You just want to make sure that you have a stash of this stuff should you, for some reason, lose access to it. That's why Jace Medical exists. They prepare you for medical emergencies. You go through their telemedicine process. They give you a year-long supply of the daily prescriptions that you and your family take. They also give you an emergency stash of antibiotics. Uh, hopefully, you'll never have to use these things, but it's so much better to be safe than sorry by preparing your family for these kinds of medical emergencies. Go to jacemedical.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's jacemedical.com, code Allie. Hey guys, if you love this podcast, please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks.